Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. What I've noticed over the last year and a half, I keep seeing all kinds of articles and comments by people on the question of memory. It's something that we ordinarily don't think about, but I believe that a healthy memory is really essential to living in the present moment. If we're going to really uh, be with it, with whatever our current experience is, it'll be because we got the past in order somehow, that it makes sense to us. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Father Thomas Landgraf, a member of the Religion Department at Central Catholic High School. Today, Father Basic and Father Landgraf discuss the question of memory. Here's Father Basic. Tom, I appreciate you being willing to speak seriously for a while. I'd like to deal with the question of time. Uh, it's something perhaps that we don't often think about, although we got a lot of sayings that deal with time. We talk about time on our hands or having to kill time. Um, especially uh, the thing that I often speak about is living uh, effectively in the present moment, mining the riches of the now, the, our need to be present to what is going on. And I, I think in general, maybe in popular writings, there's a lot of emphasis on that. But in some ways, that can end up getting distorted. People will say, yeah, but what about planning for the future? If you just live in the now, what are you going to do later on? Um, what, if you don't uh, anticipate what is going to happen, you might be caught short later on. And I think they are right. The, the idea of living in the present could be overblown so that one didn't understand that it must include a proper anticipation of the future and a, and a good way of planning that future. And on the other hand, it also includes a proper per, uh, perception of the past if we're going to l live effectively in the now. So if we want to be present to what is going on, if we want to be really with another person as we're talking to them, somehow our past has also got to be involved. We're not going to live effectively in the present unless we do have a proper memory. And it's that memory side of it that I'd like to concentrate on in our discussion. I think that memory is extremely important. In fact, during the last year and a half, I've been very attuned to what people have been saying about the question of memory. I was very taken by a book review in which um, it was a, by a Czech author. I think his name is Kundera, and I'm not remembering the title of the book now. But the, I read little excerpts from the book, and it talks about this woman whose husband died. And as she's going along, she begins to forget her husband, even within the first couple years after his death. She can't recall his image anymore. And she begins to, every man she looks at, she says she tries to rearrange his face so that it will look like her husband. And she keeps desperately trying this to keep his memory alive. And one day, she just realizes that she has forgotten what he looks like. And it's a very poignant kind of passage to me, very striking, and it raises again this whole question of memory. But it's what I've noticed over the last year and a half. I keep seeing all kinds of articles and comments by people on the question of memory. It's um, something that we ordinarily don't think about, but I believe that a healthy memory is really essential to living in the present moment. If we're going to really uh, be with it, with whatever our current experience is, it'll be because we got the past in order somehow that it makes sense to us. I think I know what you're saying because I you, sometimes you meet people, I meet people who um, they're, they're not happy in the present. And they're not happy sometimes because their memories aren't happy. They, they look back in their past and it's a, a lot of sadness, a lot of downers rather than uppers, I suppose. And uh, on the other hand, people who seem to be pretty well adjusted to the present, uh, even though they may have very painful experiences to remember, remember them with a certain feeling of we dealt with that, we got through it, uh, 
know, it was tough when it was happening, but we managed to, to survive and we went on. So I think how we view our past has an enormous influence on how we're dealing with that present moment. I think that is so true, and, I, and this is what psychotherapy really has figured out, I think, that we have to have this proper memory in order to function effectively in the present, and so that, uh, that therapy often involves going over the past, reliving those childhood experiences, thinking through, again, the traumatic experiences of adolescence, for example, taking some things that are very distasteful from the past and trying to incorporate them into a larger picture. And people very often who are not coping well with the present time find themselves having distorted images of that past. Very often, of course, what happens is it gets repressed. That is, it is just pushed down. One doesn't deal with it. The bad thing happens. We don't think our way through it. We don't analyze it. We don't even allow ourselves to feel it. We just push it down so that someone makes a very unkind, cutting remark to us. And instead of facing up to it or responding, the anger uh, sort of flares up, but we push it down. And down with it goes that whole memory. And that has a way of influencing us later on. Maybe every time we see that person, we feel uncomfortable. Or maybe we always strike out at them, and we can't figure out why anymore because we seem to be getting along with them. And yet buried deep down there is this unhappy memory. And it appears as though the process of therapy is to bring the memory out, to get it into the consciousness so that we can deal with it, so we can begin to analyze it, put it into some sort of perspective and say, well, yes, they said this cutting thing to me, but maybe they were upset that day, or it really isn't that bad, or in the light of the way they've treated me ever since, they probably didn't mean it uh, in that way. Now, that's to take a rather trivial kind of experience in the past but we know that will affect us and bringing it into our memory really seems to be helpful now some people have traumas in the past really terrible things that have happened children who have been abused by their parents uh, people with very bad sexual experiences in adolescence uh, uh, inability to deal with authority figures and getting in terrible trouble with them being put down by authority figures told that they were no good and so on some of that gets repressed and it seems as though what we need to do is to bring that out and get it into the light of consciousness I've been told in in courses and so on and I think it's also true just from my own experience that those repressed bad feelings are going to surface somewhere somehow and I think sometimes they surface and come out in ways that we cannot link what's happening to the repression. Uh, I might be very uh, upset with somebody who made that cutting remark, and I repress that. And then three or four days later, or maybe even three or four years later, I'm being unkind to a totally different person because I'm still, that anger is there, and it's sort of like a cauldron, like a volcano, that it comes out when you least expect it. Well, Many times people will be talking about, I don't know why I'm so bitchy or why I'm throwing out these remarks or why my temper just flares up like this. Very often it is a matter of a repressed rage or anger. And certainly one theory of that anger is that when it's pushed down, it builds in certain ways. I think there's simpler ways in which this experience is had by many people. I know it'll happen to me. That is, I will be vaguely uncomfortable or, or depressed in, in a slight way, just off-center in some way. And then I'll think back over the recent past, maybe the last day or yesterday, if you wake up with it, and if you stop and think of the thing that's disturbing you, get it into your consciousness, very often the bad feeling will go away. I've talked to many people who have had that simple experience. You just identify it and say, oh, yeah, the reason I'm feeling bad is because I blew that opportunity yesterday. And you think through and as soon as you remember it, the bad feeling seems to go away. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but it's another example of what we're talking about, that the past, when not dealt with, will hurt us, and the solution seems to be to get it into consciousness so that we can deal better with it. A lot of the classical therapies deal with that. Uh, so Freud got people to remember their dreams or to use free association in order to get in touch with the traumas of the past. Uh, Carl Jung talked about the shadow side of the psyche and uh, getting things out of that shadow into the light of consciousness and that this was part of the process of becoming a whole person, an individuated person, as he called it. So m most therapies in one way or another deal with that. I think one of the great problems that 
that human beings face is a, a kind of a poor concept of themselves, poor self-image. That's talked about continuously in all kinds of books and all kinds of seminars, etc. And frequently those poor self-images are due to things that happened to us in the past. I, mean, I, I can look back in my own past and it's ironic, a, a, a man who's a priest in another city who was a very good friend of mine uh, was very cutting in his remarks and I think that affected me for a long time. And, and the irony of it all is I really don't believe he is as happy in his priesthood today as I am in mine. But I, being, like you say, being able to sort of identify where some of those negative feelings are coming from in itself helps solve the problem. I think that uh, memory, too, has another uh, whole function here we could talk about, and that is uh, in our relationship with God and uh, fostering our prayer life. One of the classical reasons for praying or basis for praying has always been the idea that God has done wonderful things for us in the past. It's sort of the whole biblical message that God is produced a salvation history he's intervened in history is the kind of metaphor or image you get in the bible that uh, and he's done these wonderful deeds for us therefore we really ought to be grateful for what has gone on now this would suggest in our lives today that we at times try to focus on the good things in the past not just these bad memories but that we would uh, try to get our minds attuned to what good things have happened to us, gifts we've received, the way people have been kind to us, the opportunities that we've had to learn and to develop, just a great chance for us to grow up in this country and for those of us who grew up in good families to be appreciative of what our parents have done for us. So that I think that this cultivation of the positive memories is really a good thing. I remember discussing memory not long ago and uh, somebody in the group was suggesting that people have two dominant ways of looking at the past. That, you, you know, you either focus on all those negative things and always got them in your mind or else you tend to focus on the positive side. And I do think that's true, but what I would like to add to that is that it seems possible for me to me for people to shift so okay. that I know people that I'm dealing with who always think of the bad things that went on in the past and therefore they're up unhappy with themselves now, have a poor self-image, and they can't cope with the present complexities that they have to deal with. And what I'm trying to get them to do is to get a more positive sense of that past and say, wait a second, yes, your mother was bad in this way, but she helped you in this way. Yes, you didn't get along with the other kids in the family very often, but remember the times when things did go well. Uh, think, uh, compare yourself not so much with everything that's going great, but remember you were better off despite your troubled childhood than many other people. Remember that side of it. And I, I believe that we can shift a little bit here. At least I've seen people do that. I know we can do it. That uh, it's possible to get a more optimistic attitude and therefore improve our self-image. Now I suppose there's limits to that. And there's sometimes I've worked with people where it seems almost impossible to accomplish, but uh, I believe in it in principle that one ought to be able to do that, more positive focusing. Sometimes when it's just brought to your attention to do it, uh, we sort of drift along, and I suppose depending on whether we somewhat naturally tend to be pessimistic or optimistic would determine what memories we would bring to mind. But I think, I think you're right. I think if a person sits down and maybe for all his or her life they thought about bad things in their memory but somebody says well now deliberately let's try and think about the good things and they you, you, we can make a conscious effort to bring up good images from our past and there's hardly anybody that doesn't have at least some and I think that can have an influence what what we need maybe is the challenge to do it and not just sort of drift along doing what we've always done it almost seems to me there's an element of free will in this. We can choose what to remember if we want to. I think that is true, and I think that we have to work at it systematically. Sometimes I will program that for people and say, in, in, meditate three times a day, and during each of those meditations, think over one positive experience from the past. Try to put yourself into the situation. Feel what it was like. Remember how good you felt when somebody said something. Remember what the weather was like, the sights, the sounds, the smells. Imaginatively put yourself into that situation and then pray over it. Then say, God, thank you for that gift. 
In other words, trying to link up our image of God with the positive experiences. For many people, the real problem is that God is an ogre. He's a terrible, angry, judging kind of God. And therefore, people are feeling bad about themselves and in danger of hellfire and and worried about guilt and so on. And what I'm trying to do in that systematic therapy for people is to say, no, link up your perception of God with the happy experiences by channeling your prayer in that direction. Think about that good experience and then say, thank you, Lord, for that. And uh, remember that he's the source of that good thing that happened. And I believe that it's possible to refine our image of God in that way. I even think physiologically that that can happen. In other words, the the circuits in the brain that somehow or other are involved in memory, those in, in a certain instance that a person who does not remember good things very often, uh, those nor, uh, pathways are not well used, and therefore it's a little bit of a struggle to, to connect them. But I, th- I think it's even possible biologically to think that as we practice at it, just as our uh, movements in our arm become better when you practice at it, that as you practice linking the, the good memories with thanking God, that will become easier and more natural and more spontaneous. I think this can be done. I, I think uh, those of us who are in the helping professions have to believe that it can be done to some degree if we're going to end up helping people. Let's look at this memory business in another viewpoint, and that is the memory of suffering in our world. Memory of suffering could be a very good thing for us, a humanizing kind of thing. It works in this way. If we remember the way that individuals and groups have suffered in the past, then we become less likely to inflict suffering on people now. I think that that can work at a very individual level. When, if I remember how when someone gossiped about me, it hurt me in the past, then maybe I am prevented or led away from gossiping about someone else now. At a much larger level, if we remember the terrible uh, events of the past, for example, the bombing of Nagasaki, for example, where, and you think of the destruction or you call to mind again the way the people were hurt by that or hear the stories that still are around about the terrible suffering involved with that, then maybe one could be moved to work uh, more strenuously for peace in our world today. I suppose the prime example of this is the Holocaust. Jewish people often say we must keep the Holocaust alive in the memories of people, not just uh, as a morbid thing, but in order to prevent that from happening in the future. There's this Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, out on the West Coast for Holocaust studies, and one of their mottos is, for the sake of the future, we dare not forget the past. For the sake of the future, we dare not forget the past. And so they are trying to keep alive the the memories of the terrible atrocities of the uh, period in Nazi Germany and the death camps for the Jewish people and the deaths of the six million, uh, one of the horrible memories in all human history, surely, especially because of its irrational character and its systematic, logical character in another way, the way they carried this out. But all of that horrible memory brought to mind for the sake of the future. And the point being to not let that happen again. So that when we begin to see freedom being uh, somehow dampened, we realize that all of our freedom is threatened. When any one group is being persecuted, that the whole of the human race suffers in some way, and that we really must not allow that to happen again. So this memory of the suffering of the past seems to me to be a powerful antidote to the inhumanism that could take us over today, the lack of concern for for the causes and so on. We, we really could find in that a catalyst, I think, for being more positive about social justice and peace and war and uh, helping the disadvantaged and the suffering in the world. Brings to mind, uh, for me, what's uh, sometimes mysterious. I know myself, what I remember in my own youth, or especially when I was a younger person studying for the priesthood, the, uh, the very authoritarian superiors that I had, which I, I did not like, I will admit that, and I think uh, that that has influenced me in my present in that I do not want to be authoritarian. Same thing with some of the poor teachers I had in the past. I know certain things that they did that really irritated me, and I consciously try to avoid them as teacher myself. Yet some people, it seems that 
they look back on their past and uh, the things that were not so good, they seem to perpetuate it. Um, frequently enough, I've been told that um, children who come from homes where the parents are very authoritarian and, and almost dictatorial and very strict and so forth, very often end up being that kind of parent themselves. And I must admit, I guess I'll throw that out as a question if you want to respond to it. I don't understand that. I don't understand what the dynamic no, is. I there. don't know that I understand it either, but I have heard things like that too, that children who are subjected to child abuse, for example, are, may well uh, have a higher percentage rate of becoming abusers of their own children. Um, it, it just looks to me like we are a enabled to interpret those past experiences in two different ways. I mean, positive in saying, hey, that suffering is terrible. I won't inflict it on somebody else. Or, or I went through it by golly, and other people are going to go through it the same way. It's, again, that attitude we bring to the past that seems all important to me. And uh, where, again, we would try to get a positive response. I remember a line from Ailey Weissel talking about the Holocaust. I, I think I heard it on television quite a while ago where he said, suffering's good for only one thing, and that is to learn not to inflict more of it on other people. I have this image of that there's a pool of suffering in the world. There's a lot of it around. And one of the things one ought to try to do in life is not increase that pool of suffering. And positively put, that if in some tiny ways one could diminish that pool of suffering, it would be a really great thing to do in life. I really think that uh, the whole message of Jesus comes right out of that. He's a healing. Uh, the kingdom is a time when, when suffering would be diminished. Uh, the fullness of life that, that Jesus offers us. I think there's a lot to the, the whole redemptive notion of Christ as being one who is offering to human beings a possibility to live life in a good way without suffering. The fullness of life means it'll be joyful and, and painless. Yes, there's a theologian these days who talks about the dangerous and liberating memory of Jesus. Dangerous and liberating memory of Jesus, which is a striking phrase. His notion is that when we look back on the memory of Jesus, that we see the way he fought against all the enslaving structures of his time, that we see how he had this special care for the disadvantaged, how he reached out to try to help those who were troubled. And in doing so, we're challenged to do something similar today. We're challenged to look at any of the ways in which people are oppressed by the structures of the world today. And we're challenged again to try to do our part in trying to heal. So the, the, the church ought to be the group that keeps alive the dangerous and liberating memory of Jesus. That's what we're doing as a community. We keep recalling what he was all about. And we're able to do this in our private lives as well. That's what reading the scriptures is about in a sense. You go back and recall how God has been on the side of fighting suffering. How God has been the one who's trying to establish the kingdom and trying to overcome all of the evils in the world. That's part of what I think liturgy is about. When we come together to worship, it is a memory. We call that the Lord's Supper, a memorial meal, in which we're recalling again what Jesus did, bringing to mind again that dangerous and liberating memory of Jesus, which is not just for the sake of the past. It's just not a nostalgia trip to go into the Bible or into liturgy or talk about Jesus. But the precise point of it is that it's to liberate us for the present moment. And I think that uh, this is the way it really should function. We keep our memory sharpened and alive so as to get a new energy for trying to deal with the ills of our world, our personal foibles, the sins that plague us, and to say, hey, I've got to keep working at those. I, th I believe that the, the memory of the uh, pre-resurrection life of Jesus is, is what motivates most of us to look forward to a time when we can share the post-resurrection life of Jesus, which is the, the fullness of life. I believe those memories are, are at the core of our whole religious structure. It's at the core of my personal belief that I remember what Jesus said, what he did. I remember, too, that he suffered terribly for it, but I remember that he rose. And, he, and I, then I recall, or it's more than a, a bring to mind, that he lives today in, in his spirit and so on. Right, and that concentration on the resurrection then gives the positive side to the whole message. That becomes the, 
the victorious memory then, mm -hmm. the memory that energizes and liberates and gives us hope in the world which we need. The memory of the resurrection certainly is a key part of recalling Jesus. I have the feeling that this question of memory is so essential to all of us in our personal growth. You know, when we look on our lives, uh, it, it is so important to get the past into order. If I hate my past, I'm going to hate part of myself. If I have an incorporated part of my past into my current being, then I'm walking uh, in some way impoverished in life. I don't have all the resources I should have. I need to have myself rooted somehow. I have to be able to remember a tradition which allows me to stand someplace. I have to have in my memory a solid faith that enables me to encounter all of the difficulties in the world. I need the, this memory of Jesus in order to somehow move me to action and give me hope in our world today. Surely, Tom, there is a proper forgetting. There's a lot we've got to leave behind us. There's no sense dwelling on the past, no sense going over guilt feelings again. Once we're forgiven, we ought to be able to leave that stuff go. A lot of the trivia in the past isn't worth remembering. But on the other hand, there are rich resources back there. The memory is like a great cave. And we bring out of that great cave resources and strengths, a rootedness in the past and a memory of the good things that God has done for us. And especially this liberating memory of Jesus, which could really enable us to live so much more effectively in the present. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic. Lecturer and Campus Minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Father Thomas Landgraf, a member of the Religion Department at Central Catholic High School. The topic of this week's reflections was the question of memory. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson. Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner. Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network.